All right, so look, it's Wednesday night. You know what it is, man. I got my guy, Zach. I'm Rob Odie. This is Spotlight 39. This is the show each and every week where we recap some of the big matchups, some of the big upsets, some of the lopsided wins, you know, whatever it is, all the big games we talk about them. That's what we do. And then we set the stage for all the fun big matchups coming up this weekend. Typically, we're joined by special guests, either student athletes and or coaches. So make sure you hit that subscribe button, turn the notifications on, comment, like, all the fun stuff that YouTube likes. Shout out to the sponsors, I Am Power, I Am Power Energy Drink. I mess that up every week. That's a mouthful. And then the Great White Premium Apparel. Check out their website at thegreatwhite.shop. And more importantly, check out the nonprofit 39 Hearts Foundation. I don't want to forget about that. That is why Spotlight 39 exists. Every strong athlete needs a strong heart. So all that stuff out of the way, man. You ready to have some fun? Let's talk about some games. Talk about, uh, I don't know that we had really any big upsets this week. Um, but we had some fun games nonetheless. So where do we want to start? I think you were in Vegas, right? Yeah, man. I was out there watching a little Gorman Olu. Right. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, let's, it was let, fun, let's, man. Let's, it, let's kick it off. So we've had Gorman. I think we featured Gorman, you know, respectfully each and every week. I mean, they pretty much yeah. had a big game every single week to kick off the season. Uh, they're ranked where they're at, you know, for a reason. Uh, they're still, what, they're in the top five? Is that, that right? Yeah. Yeah, they got the last spot at number five right now. So Yeah, so still within the top five and continue to play powerhouse programs. This week was no different. They played a very, very difficult Orange Lutheran out of Cali. You were there. You were on the sidelines. I'm seeing all the, the highlights. I'm jealous. You're there. I'm not. Talk to me. What did you see? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, the offense was clicking for Gorman. Micah Eugenio got the start. Junior quarterback Melvin Spicer down with a shoulder injury. Just a couple of weeks, he should be back too. But yeah, he he shined in his opportunity. He got his QB one. He threw for six touchdowns, nearly three hundred yards. Uh, Greg Toller had a big game. He had three receiving touchdowns. He also threw a touchdown on a trick play. But yeah, the offense was clicking. I don't think Gorman punted till the fourth quarter. They were just doing whatever they wanted against a very talented Orange Lutheran defense. So that was kind of shocking to me. I said last week I thought it was going to be kind of a a low scoring game. And then, boom, Gorman comes out and puts 55 on the board. I think there was a, you know, they're a little upset after the performance against Modern Day, and they took it out on another Trinity League opponent in Orange Lutheran. But, yeah, big bounce back win for Gorman. This was a big win for them because this is their last out-of-state game. The rest will be all in-state opponents. So I don't know how much more we'll be talking about Bishop Gorman because they're going to probably win every game the rest of the way pretty handily against in-state competition. We've seen how Bishop Gorman has dominated Nevada opponents. Yeah, I mean, it's been a lot of fun. I'm sure, you know, they'll 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 make their way somehow back on the show from here and there. Uh, but Orange Lutheran, they've kind of been up and down, right? Where do they go from here? Um, they're, they're in a very difficult league. So where do you see the rest of the season unfolding for Orange Lutheran? Yeah, I mean, the nice thing for the Lancers, they have a lot of good opponents coming up. You know, they close out non-league play this Saturday against a very talented Sierra Canyon team. And then after that, they get Bosco, and then obviously that starts Trinity League play. So they dropped a few spots from, uh, you know, number 12 to number 17. They have that quality win against St. Francis Academy. We saw St. Francis Academy play Duncanville, the number 14, very competitively, and they almost pulled that game out on the road. We'll talk about that game here shortly too. But, yeah, Orange Lutheran, you know, it was going to be tough for them this year to somehow go undefeated. They have the toughest schedule in the country, according to us. So, you know, you knew one of these L's was going to come eventually, and it came in Vegas because I think Gorman was just taking it out on them after that modern day L. Yeah, you know, it, it definitely wasn't the ideal, you know, location for them to go into. You know, Gorman definitely had a chip on their shoulder. They came out, they showed the the country, you know, hey, we're no pushover. We might have took an L, we'll take it on the chin, but this is what we're capable of, and they did just that. So uh, I think both are going to be – you know, poised for a solid season. Gorman, I think, like you said, they're probably going to run the table. They're going to finish this thing out strong. Yeah. Orange Lutheran, I, I, TBD. I think you can. I think you can even say take out the word probably. I, Gorman will run the table for sure, hundred percent. Hundred. Look, we can't say that. I, I'm an no, Eagles fan, man, and I was. I, my analytics said yeah. I was damn near a hundred percent. If they ran the ball, took a sack, took a knee, I don't care what they did. As long as they didn't throw it and, and miss the pass, they would have walked away with a win. I'll say this. I understand it, but 
they drew up a perfect play call, easy catch for Saquon. He just dropped it, and then, you know, the rest is history. What I don't get, man, if you're going to be aggressive on third and three, it, be aggressive on fourth and three and go for the first down instead of kicking the field goal there too. That is, look, there was there was a lot of things that made me scratch my head as an Eagles fan, but nonetheless, let's go birds. Anyway, <laughs> let's continue the fun and let's talk about. Hmm, let's take it to Texas. Yeah, I'm, gonna, yeah. I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna let you say the name one more time because I stand corrected. They did exactly what you thought that they were capable of doing, and, and they pulled out the W. So talk talk me through this game here. Yeah, Atasca Cita, man, they. Uh... They jumped in the top 25 this week after beating Westlake. And, uh, you know, they're the third program since 2019 to now own a win against Austin Westlake. North Shore has two. And then Lake Travis back in 2019. So these three teams are the only ones to beat Austin Westlake since 2019. Impressive win for Atascacita. It was on the road also. I love Carde Mack. This is a, a 2026 athlete plays quarterback can play running back he can line up all over the field and he showed his athleticism in that 39 21 win against austin westlake he was kind of the the biggest play of the game they were up 24 21 there was a fumble in the backfield and mac picked it up and then he went about 60 yards for the touchdown that kind of really sealed the win for atasco cita so they become the 15 from texas now in the max preps top 25 and uh, they're going to obviously be a team to watch in Texas. They got a pretty tough schedule coming up here, so it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. But, yeah, they're they're loaded, man. They got a couple of ballers with Cardi and Mack leading the way. Yeah, so let's just kind of touch on where they go from here. I mean, they, they knock off Westlake. They still have a couple of big ones to go. Where do you see the, you know, the season kind of unfolding for them going forward? And then I guess same yeah. thing with Westlake. I mean, you know, their schedule's no no pushover for the rest of the season either. They still have a couple of big ones left. Yeah, no, it'll be interesting to see. You know, they got I'd pull up their schedule right here. They got Summer Creek coming up October fourth. That'll be a that'll be a tough game. A tough game. You know, Summer Creek made it all the way to the six A D two state title game last year. Obviously, got handled pretty bad against DeSoto. And then the North Shore game on October 25th, that's going to be a game to circle. That'll be the same night Modern Day and St. John Bosco play. But that could be a huge game in Texas if both those teams are still undefeated. You know, North Shore checks in at number eight in our Max Preps top 25. And both these teams have played each other very well here lately, too. So those two games are obviously the two to, to pay attention to, especially that North Shore game. But, yeah, I love what Atasco Cita is doing, too. You know, obviously with Cardi and Mac, you got Tory Blaylock also a 2025 Oklahoma commit. So, they got a couple of dudes in the backfield that can really wreak havoc on a defense. I love it. I love it. So we'll see how that unfolds, and I'm sure we'll be talking about both of these schools throughout the rest of the season. But let's take it from Texas, and let's go to the hot bid, hot Atlanta. Let's go to Georgia. Let's talk about Juju and Carrollton against a very, very well-coached program in Gainesville. Thought it was going to be a little closer than what it was. Yeah. However... You know, the Trojans, gets, they, they continue to show exactly what they're capable of, right? They're ranked, what, nine? Am I right? Yeah, they jumped, up, they jumped up to seven this week after that that shellacking yeah. against Gainesville. So. Yeah, so, so they put up some numbers, and let's just kind of pull it up. You've got, passing-wise, Julian Lewis was, what, 15 for 19, 184 yep. yards, two touchdowns, did throw a pick. The a pick, pick yeah, itself, yeah. you know – yeah, he owns that one, right? But then you had Farmar, 152 yards on 15 carries, two touchdowns, putting up crazy numbers. And then you can't get away without Mosley, six receptions, 117 yards, two touchdowns in the, the air. So big, big game for Carrollton. What's your take here? Where does where does Gainville go, right? I mean, this was probably their toughest matchup you know, for the season, but they still have a couple of – pretty notable games left. I mean, they do play in Georgia. They play, you know, a lot of bigger programs, but you know, they're three. Yeah, and one. They, got, they got Milton later in the year too. Yeah, so. exactly. So that's a, you know, they still have a couple of, you know, sizable matchups left. They're three and one now. Where do they go from here? And then where do you see Carrollton going? I mean, they continue to climb the rankings. Um, they started what mid, they what 15 ish or so in the season, 19, maybe. And then they just continue to climb, continue to climb. Now they find themselves 5-0. and Talk to me. 
Yeah, no, I mean, I was impressed with with Carrollton starting with them first. You know, I, I thought this game was going to be a little more competitive. Gainesville came into this one only allowing, I believe it was 5.6 points per game. So, but at Carrollton's offense, they're just, they're just a different animal. They're getting better each week too. And, you know, Coach King is one of the best at coaching quarterbacks. And you're seeing Julian Lewis, who's developed every year. I mean, obviously this kid was a stud even before high school, but ever since he stepped foot as a starting quarterback since day one as a freshman, he's balled out. I mean, he led Carrollton all the way to the 7A state title game as a freshman, had another tremendous year as a sophomore. But the leaps he's even taken this year, it's just it's mind boggling because he was already a great quarterback and he continues to get better and better. He's just so good at at running the offense. He doesn't turn the ball over. He has 20 touchdown passes to only two interceptions this year. And he's so smart with the football. He has a, a completion percentage at it's like 79.8 percent. I believe it's just under 80 percent, though. He just does a, a great job of running the offense. They got a well-balanced attack with a couple of stud running backs. And I'm a, I'm a huge fan. I've been preaching Ryan Mosey's name all season long, and he is balling out so far this year as a junior. He's going to be a, a receiver that every college is going to throw an offer to because he is a game changer. He has perfect size, and he has a, exactly what you want in a wide out. And the defense is balling out too. So, you know, this is going to be a tough team to beat in 6A this year the way Carrollton's playing. It'll be fun to see them this week too because they get the the game on ESPN2 on Friday against Parker. A team loaded with talent. They're one of the better teams in the state of Alabama. And, uh, you know, obviously they got Naeem offered a 2025 Ohio State commit. He's the number one rated prospect in the state of Alabama. He's a guy that's playing both ways. But obviously when he gets to, you know, Ohio State, he's going to be playing corner. But he's also making an impact as a running back this year for a 4 0 Parker squad. Yeah. It's, I mean, again, I got to see, you know, Julian last year on opening day um, against Langston Hughes. Looked a little rusty. That was pre-commitment. And then, you know, talking through it with my guy, Coach E, I was like, look, you know, once this young man gets the commitment out of the way and he gets that weight off of his shoulders, I'm really curious as to see, you know, where he goes from there. And we got to see just that, right? I mean, he had a remarkable season last year, and then he's continuing to, to get that much better this year. Completion percentage of, you know, damn near 80%. That's outrageous. Yeah. I mean, it, in, in realistically, he's a senior, but he should be a junior right now. He reclassed. He's going to go to college early. He and he's not one guy. of those. He's not one of those kids either that was, you know, held back and older for his grade. He he she really is the age of a junior right now too. And the way he's playing, yep. man, especially with all the pressure, because Julian Lewis has been a name since before high school. People oh, were talking about Julian Lewis before he was even in ninth grade, and he's really. You know, it didn't bother him at all. He loves pressure, man. And the and the best part was you said ESPN's got him again this Friday. This is the second one yeah. this season. I think this is the third one in the last two seasons. Because last year against yeah. Langston Hughes, that was an ESPN yeah. game. He's got two already. You know, so he's under the spotlight. That is what he is. And he he absorbs it and he he just enjoys it. I mean, he owns that moment and he doesn't let it get to him. You know, he's not worried about the cameras. Yeah. He's not worried about who's watching, who's not watching. He is worried about being the best version of him and the best version of the, you know, the teammate that he can be to get Carrollton yeah, that yeah. win. And he's doing just that. And you knew he had to show out last week, too, because did you see who made the trip out there to go watch him? Who was that? Lincoln Riley. So. How about that? He had, he had to put on for his future college coach. I know there's a lot of talk going on. Oh, he's going to decommit this and that. But, hey, if Lincoln Riley's coast flying coast. out to Georgia to go watch your game, We'll see what happens. Look, I mean, it, you you don't get the head coach too, too often. I mean, you see Coach Franklin. He likes to make his rounds. We saw him helicopter into IMG, you know, but that's what he does. Lincoln Riley, how often do you see Lincoln Riley on the East Coast on the sideline checking out, you know, a specific player? Not very often. Yeah. and that's West a, Coast, a, you'll a, see him. East yeah, Coast, that's a, that's not a so long likely. trip, man. That's a long trip, man, from SoCal to Georgia, too. And the offensive line coach from SC was at the Gorman game, so I was chopping it up with him a little bit. Obviously, he's there to go see two of the best offensive lines with Bishop Gorman and Orange Lutheran. So SC was doing a lot of flying around last week to check on some top prospects because they had a bye week getting ready to go to Ann Arbor and uh, take down Michigan this Saturday. I can't wait. <laughs> take down Michigan. Oh, yeah, boy. We'll see. We'll see, man. But <laughs> we'll, I, see. we'll see. I like it. <laughs> 
But let's just keep it in Georgia. We got one more to recap. Actually, we got two more to recap. Let's just yeah. keep it in Georgia, though. We're going to go Beaufort, Douglas County. I stand corrected. I thought Me Douglas too. County was going to get, you know, get to work. They were going to – it was going to be close. I thought they were going to knock off Buford. We see a 31-14 walk me through what what you what you saw in this game because this was not what was expected yeah so usually when i'm at a game friday night when it's halftime i'll you know jump on my phone check the scores all the other top 25 games going on and i was like oh wow 31 to 14 man that's that's an impressive win right there because douglas county's got some dudes but buford they played well they ran the ball well justin baker tennessee commit had a big game on the ground over 100 yards rushing two tutties uh, Dayton Riola, junior quarterback, obviously his older bro Dylan's doing doing big things right now for Nebraska. But Dayton, man, I'm loving Eleven the way he's playing. 15. Eleven for yeah, fifteen. Yeah, he's 148. Yeah, he's getting better each week. You know, each you can see the confidence growing, and uh, I, I like what Buford's got going on. They played Milton Tough this year too. You know, 13-10 loss. You were there. The weather was crazy. Uh, that's a tough game, but I like Buford's defense, man. Uh, Montrez Walker, a Colorado commit, a linebacker. He's just one of the you know many talented guys they have on defense. But I don't know if there's a more violent linebacker in the country than that dude right there. He really sets the tone for that defense. Yeah, and, you know, we can't discredit Douglas County. You know, they may have only put up 14, but, you know, they've got superstars across that team, you know, just like Buford. You know, honestly, we thought it was going to be a different outcome. Um, Quarterback-wise, not the greatest showing, right? 13 for 24, one tutty two interceptions but then you have Aaron Gregory who had the the best night receiving four receptions 91 yards and a touchdown so they had yeah. some they had, they had some a crazy closing. pick six touchdown too it was one of yeah. the more bizarre interceptions interceptions you'll ever see so that was another you know seven points at Douglas County so really Buford's defense only allowed that one touchdown to Aaron Gregory so that's Georgia now let's take it back to Texas and we're going to talk about DMV game of the, versus yeah, game of the Texas. Week right you know, this was – it could have gone either way. You said it should have been probably a little little more lopsided than it was, but we got a 24-28 win, Duncanville. Well, I was keeping up with it, you know, in between, you know, the game that I was at. I honestly thought St. Francis was going to pull it out, and then when I refreshed afterwards, I was like, well, damn, 28-24 – Talk to. Yeah, man, I had to take a little break in Vegas, man. I had to, you know, go back to the hotel because I wanted to watch this one. So, yeah, yeah, St. Francis was playing great. You know, obviously, Duncanville opening possession, they drove down, scored, got up 7 nothing, And then, you know, if Duncanville went for it on fourth down. Keelan Russell looked like he scored. Refs ruled it. He fumbled before he crossed the end zone, ruled it a touchback. You know, I don't know how much that play would have mattered because there was holding call in Duncanville either way. But, yeah, Dunkville ended up well, St. Francis jumped up 16 to 7, kind of had control, then Dunkville got things rolling. And then they were up 21-16, and then they had the ball at the St. Francis 20 late in the fourth, about four minutes left. And Keelon tried to throw a little screen pass on the side. Blake Woodby, who's having a tremendous year, got the interception, nearly housed it on an interception. St. Francis punched in on the next play. And then that's what impressed me the most was the resolve of Keelan Russell, a five-star Alabama commit. A lot of quarterbacks might be frazzled, man. You just do an interception. You think, oh, man, I just might have cost my team the game right here. He leads Duncan on a five-play, 87-yard drive, capped off with a touchdown to uh, Zach Turner, a, a stud 2026 wide receiver, can also play tight end. But, yeah, big drive by Keelan Russell and Duncanville. That was a big win for the state of Texas, man. They don't want to lose another one of these big out-of-state games. No. And it was looking like St. Francis was going to walk into Duncanville and steal that one. But big time drive by Keelan Russell. And then Duncanville got three consecutive sacks to to ice that game and walk out with a 28-24 win. You got to give a shout out to, you know, Neaman Borner, who got the three sacks on that drive to turn St. Francis over on downs. And also Ace and Theus had a big game, too. He had two touchdown grabs for Duncanville. Yeah, I mean, if you just think about Duncanville, you had Russell go 20 for 26. 265, three touchdowns. Then on the, the receiving, I mean, the, the rushing side, right? We had, mm, what, Armstrong probably had the best performance. 21, 21 carries, 88 yards, didn't get in. He had a big he had a big second half, though. He had some big, big runs in the second half to kind of get 
it, it, it's tough, man. You're not going to beat a team like St. Francis if you can't run the ball well. And he That's had right. a he had a big second half, had some big runs for that offense. Yeah, and then receiving wise, they you know they contained more for the better part of the game. Four receptions, thirty four total yards. But then you you had the the other receivers, right? You had Turner ten for one eighteen with a touchdown, and Theus six for one hundred nine and two touchdowns. I mean that against the St. Francis DB core that they take a lot of yeah. pride in that space. I mean those guys are they're some dudes, and you know they well, that's, they, that's they held like more. Record. Yeah, DeCorey Moore opens it up for everybody, though. That's the thing. You yes, got to focus sir. on him. that. Allows the other receivers to eat, and they they had a big time game, man. Both those guys, all three of those guys, are big time wide receivers for Keelan Russell. Yeah, so let's just kind of stick with Duncanville. You know, their season's really just starting to to get rolling. They still got a DeSoto coming up that that you're going to be at. Where do they yeah. go from here? What's the rest of their season look like? I mean, twenty eight, twenty four. Solid win. I wouldn't call it super impressive. You know, obviously some things to get cleaned up. But where do they go from here to get ready for that DeSoto game? Hey, you also got to look at it too, man. This is Duncanville's second game of the year. The first one was a blowout pretty much. Not a blowout, but they won handily. And, uh, you know, it takes a few games to get things clicking too. So this was this was a nice win, even though it was only a four-point dub. But, yeah, obviously, you know, that DeSoto game, middle of October, that's going to be the one that's going to, you know, they want to get that one back. You know, that's Keelan Russell's only loss as a starter. So that's going to be the game they got circled October 12th. But, yeah, St. Francis, though, things don't get any easier for them. Now they got to go out to SoCal and play at number one modern day on Friday. So that'll be – I'll tell you what, though, St. Francis, they're tested. So they're going to be ready to roll Friday, and they want to get one back. They don't want to go through this three-game, you know, tough road trip with Olu, uh, Duncanville, in modern day, they don't want to go winless in this one. So we'll see what happens Friday. I would be surprised if they pulled off the upset, but they played modern day tough last year. You know, modern yeah, day found a way to win 20 to seven, but it was a one score game pretty much throughout. And then modern day tacked on a touchdown late to get up 20 to seven. But the defense has played, played great in that game. Modern day had two defensive touchdowns in that one. Nasir White had a scoop and score. And then uh, Chuck McDonald had a pick six. So how much of a, a factor do you think this travel schedule is going to be for St. Francis? Because this is now game, this will be game five for them all the yeah, way, yeah. all heavy travel. This is what, second trip out to Cali. They went out there to play Orange Lutheran two weeks ago, went out to, to Texas to play Duncanville, and now they're going back to Cali for a very, very, very powerful modern day program. How much of a factor is that travel? I uh, I mean I feel like as a program they're they're used to it so I don't I don't think it's huge. You also got Modern Day who's making the trip back from Hawaii. They went out and played Kahuku on okay, Saturday one thirty yeah one thirty eight seven one pretty easily. So yeah I don't I don't think it's a huge factor. I think St. Francis is a program they're used to this type of travel, so it, it's nothing new. But it's going to be a tough task anyways going out to to play the number one team in the country, especially the way Modern Day looked against Bishop Gorman who then obviously, you know, Orange Lutheran beat St. Francis and Gorman beat St. Francis or beat, uh, you know, Olu 55-28, so. So, I'm assuming we're going modern day, but you, you started off by saying you wouldn't be surprised if St. Francis pulled the upset. What will it take oh, for St. Francis I'd be to get the upset? Yeah, yeah I'd, be, I'd be very, very surprised. Yeah, I, they got to play a perfect game. Modern day has got to get turnovers, you know. I'm a big fan of Dash Byerly. I think he's played great, but you know, St. Francis has to shut down the running game and you got to see if Dash Byerly can beat you throwing the ball. That's going to be their best chance to win to see what happens. But I, I just think modern day has got too many guys all over the field. They got a great coaching staff on top of that. I just don't see modern day's weakness this year. So, I mean, maybe their one weakness would be a lot of penalties, but it hasn't, it hasn't really factored into any game so far, even games they've had a lot of penalties. Fair enough. So if we're taking modern day by how much, where do you, where do you see the score going on this one? I think St. Francis defensively will do a decent job. I think it'll be like 31, seven modern day. Okay. So still, a, there's still a few good scores. Yeah. I, yeah. I think they'll find a way. I wouldn't be surprised if they had a defensive score, forced a couple of turnovers to get their offense short field. So I, yeah, I, 
I, I just think modern day on both sides of the ball, they're just they're just too good. No, I'm with you. As much as I want to pull for the the home team and go DMV, I don't know that I can go against the grain and disagree. I do think modern day um, just is built different this year. I think they're damn near unbeatable. And I don't, you know, I don't want to say anybody's unbeatable, but if any team is going to be built that way, I think modern day has it this year. They just don't necessarily have any gaps or weaknesses that are very explicitly open, right? You know, you've really got to dig deep into the film to find something that's going to give you a competitive advantage against modern day. And I don't know that St. Francis is going to have that this week, especially having to go and play the gauntlet of games that they're, you know, they've already done, you know, regardless if you're used to it or not, you know, they're still kids. And at the end of the day, you know, these kids are, are you know, they're going to get tired. They're traveling, yeah. they're traveling, they're traveling, because not only are they traveling and they're going to prepare for the game, but they're going and they're doing college visits, right? They're doing, you know, other things while they're in these different states, you know, so it's, it's taxing. So I'm very curious to see, you know, what they're going to be able to do. They played strong against modern day, but that was in Baltimore last year. So them traveling back out West, I don't know that they're going to have enough in the tank. Um, we'll see, but I think uh, you're pretty spot on. I think modern day by at least three scores. Yeah. And two on top of that, modern day has done great against out of state competition since 2017. They're, uh, they're 18 and 0, I believe. Oh, they'll be going for 18 and 0 on Friday when they play same. Actually, no, they did improve 18 and 0 with the win over Kahuku. So it's pretty impressive, man. They haven't dropped an out of state game. I don't think they've ever lost an out of state game, but I didn't do enough research to go back pre 2000, but I know since 2017, they're now 18 and 0 against out of state competition. 18 and 0 in counting. I mean, they are they're built for it. I mean, that's just what it is, and they continue to show each and every year, you know, exactly why. So that's modern day St. Francis, East Coast, West Coast, Biggie versus Pac. Let's have a lot of fun with it, man. We'll see what happens. We got modern day. We both go modern day by a couple of scores. But let's take it from Cali. Let's go to Ohio. We like yeah, talking yeah. about Ohio, man. So let's talk about Ohio here. What do we got with this big, probably, you know, two of the top programs in the state, two yeah. programs that, you know, I've learned now that actually have a, a rich history of winning, which is yeah. awesome. So St. Edwards, you know, where where do where do we see this game going? Yeah, you know, it's tough for, for St. Ed's. You know, they lost their top player, Brandon White. He got hurt against uh a Boyle County in that game. He missed last week's game. I expect him to be out for a while. So in comes Tyrese Buchanan. He had a big time game last week against a previously undefeated elder team. He went for I think it was like 161 yards and two touchdowns that 24 17 win. So that was a nice bounce back win for St. Edward after that tough loss against Boyle County. And then Maslin obviously had that loss against Bergen Catholic. They bounced back last week, played a team from New York. So yeah, these are the top two teams in the state. We'll find out who number one is on, on Friday. You know, Maslin is a team they've won two straight times against St. Ed's each last two years. So see if they can ride that momentum. But yeah, I, I this is tough, man. I think it's going to be tough for St. Ed's to find a way to get this win without a guy like Brandon White, who was a preseason Max Preps Junior All-American at running back. The dude's an absolute stud. So he's going to be tough to replace. But luckily for St. Ed's, they always have a great offensive line. So we'll see how that factors in. But I'm kind of leaning Maslin in this one. But but we'll see. I know St. Ed's has had this one circled on the calendar since last year. They want to get this one back and snap that two-game losing skid they got against Maslin. So Maslin... For the win is, is where we're going. That's who I've got. Um, you know, they got Damari Clemens, who, you know, I got to watch him go from upstate New York, went to Grayson last year, transferred back home up to, you know, Rochester. And now he's at Maslin. So, you know, just out of default, I'm going Maslin over St. Edward. Um, but we'll see when this thing all plays out later in the week. If St. Edward's wins, where where do they go from here? Do they do they bump up in the the rankings? Do they kind of solidify themselves as as that program in Ohio, or do they still have you know a couple of more challenges to to get through the remainder of the season? Yeah, I think the winner of this game is going to have a good chance to jump in the top twenty five next week. You know, obviously depending on how the top twenty five teams do, but yeah, St. Ed's right now is the first team out at twenty six. They still have that big time win against St. Joe's Prep, so. That goes a long way. And Maslin, on the other hand, too, I think they're at number 32, just outside of the top 25. So, yeah, the winner of this game 
is going to have a good chance to rejoin the Max Preps top 25. Because if you look at both their losses, you know, Boyle County, top team in Kentucky, and I think they can compete with a lot of teams this year. Montave and Quisenberry is that dude. And then Maslin <laughs> obviously lost to Bergen Catholic, who's, you know, their premier program every single year. Yeah, I mean, it, it's been a it's kind of been a unique start to the football season, you know, some kind of scratch your head moments. Uh, but it'll be fun to watch, you know, this thing play out. And you mentioned St. Joe's prep. Uh, I'm excited. I, we don't have the card for their game against Good Counsel this week. Um, but that's not a game that we shouldn't, you know, leave off the beat because I will be there covering it uh, from the sidelines. I'm pretty excited to see St. Joe's. I've not covered them before. And obviously, you know, I got a lot of love for, for Good Counsel. They tend to roll out the red carpet uh, when yeah, I show up. Program. So, you know, great fantastic program. program, great coaching, great, you know, athletic department as a whole. So I'm excited to get there and see them boys from St. Joe's prep. Uh, St. Joe's it's prep been, is what dropped. Are they down one or two games this week, uh, this season? Cause I know good council just, just dropped their second. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so yeah, kind of with good council, man. But yeah, you know, St. Joe's prep, they're still close to jumping back in the top 25. They only have that one loss to St. Edward. And you saw Marvin Harrison Jr. last week for uh, Arizona ball out. His younger brother, Jet Harrison, been starting as a freshman, which is crazy at a at a team like St. Joe's Prep. He's having a good, good year so far, too. So that'll be a fun guy to go check out. Yep. No, I will definitely have some some clips of, of all the action. You know, good counsel Friday night. So I'm excited for that one. Let's see. Where do we go from here? We're going to go Ohio. Let's take it. Let's go South Florida. Let's talk Nor. What is it, Norlin, Shamadad? Yeah. What do we got here? I mean, Norlin, they've kind of, you know, kind of, I guess, moved up in the rankings, especially in the the Florida State rankings that I've seen pop up on the, you know, the timeline. Shamadad, they've been one of those scratch your head type teams this season. They've been up, they've been down. You kind of trying to figure them out. What do you see in this matchup here? Yeah, Norland, man, they're, they're coming off a nice win against uh, Teddy Bridgewater's Northwestern squad last week. They were down, I believe they were down 17-8 to eight in the fourth quarter, and then they outscored them 13 nothing in the final frame to walk out with a 21-17 win. So that's a that's a big win for Norland. Northwestern's a good program. You know, both their losses have come down the stretch, obviously lost that overtime game against Venice earlier in the year. It's another big game for them, you know. They they keep moving up in the top 100. They're getting closer and closer to joining the top 25. You know, Eugenio Yapor, a big-time quarterback, he's been putting up numbers since he was an eighth grader playing varsity football. They got a lot of guys on defense, too. So this is a well-balanced team. But Shamanon Madonna, you know, obviously lost that game against Bosco late and then had that tough loss against Blanche Eli. But they've, they've bounced back for sure. They won two in a row, had that big win against Heritage. Uh, Preston Wright's played great. He's been QB1 the last two weeks, came in that game against Blanche Eli when uh, Tyler Chance got a little banged up. So he's played great ball. He threw for over 400 yards against Heritage. He's had four passing touchdowns in each of the last two weeks. So another opportunity for him to show out against a big program like Norland. You know, obviously, Shaman on Madonna's had a, a couple of guys transfer out, so it's been a little different this year, but they still have guys stepping up. They still got a very good receiving core. And, you know, Derek, Cooper, a big time running back in the backfield, so they still got some dudes. This will be a this will be a fun game on Thursday. I, I think Shamanon Madonna is going to hand Norland their first loss of the season, though. I think I think we're going to agree again. Uh, I do think that Shamanon is is finding their way. I think they're you know starting to put some of the pieces together, even with you know everything that they've got going on around them. I do think they're going to find a way to to knock off Norland this week. Uh, I think it's going to be close, probably within you know one maybe two scores at most. But it's, it's going to be a good game. I don't think it's going to be very high scoring, uh, is my opinion. But that's what I've got. Where are you at? Yeah, no, I, I think Shamanad's going to find a way to get this one done. I, I think offensively, they're clicking now. Uh, I love the way Preston Wright's playing, man. This is a guy who's getting his chance, and he's showing out as QB1. So, I mean, going into the year, most people thought he'd be the third quarterback on the depth chart, and now he's here making plays. I mean, he was... He had that huge game against Heritage, so, you know, he's had back-to-back -back impressive performances. He's looking to make it three in a row, and I think he will. Let's do it. So let's just stick with Florida then, and let's talk about American Heritage. They've got a, a pretty big matchup this week. They're playing Miami Central. What do we got here? Central, typically powerhouse. They, they kind of got shown that, you know, they're not necessarily always the biggest, baddest on the block. 
somebody went you know down early, knocked them off. Now they get a another big matchup against American Heritage. Dia Bell, you know they're two and two. What do you got in this matchup? Yeah, you know obviously Miami Central dropped that op- the season opener to Lakeland, and you know Lakeland's one of the best teams in the state of Florida too. So not a terrible loss, but you know a game most people thought Miami Central was going to win, especially at Traz Powell, but. Yeah, you, you look at it, and Miami Central, since that loss, they've outscored the last three opponents 176 to 32. They're, they're playing great on both sides of the ball. Uh, Nashawn Montgomery, a 2025 Florida commit, this dude's been an absolute baller. He had a great game against Lakeland, too, even in that loss, but he's definitely a playmaker for Miami Central. Defense is playing great. But, you know, Heritage, obviously, with that connection with Dia Bell and Malachi Tony, one of the best quarterback wide receiver duos. And you got Byron Lewis in the backfield. This is going to be, uh, I don't know. I, I keep going back and forth with this one. I, I wouldn't be surprised either way. Uh, I'm kind of leaning Dia Bell and Malachi Tony, but uh, Miami Central, man, they're they're getting better each week. That was a tough loss against Lakeland. I think that put a sour taste in their mouth, and they've been taken out on their last three opponents. Obviously, they take a you know, step up in competition. Their toughest opponent so far this year outside of Lakeland was probably Booker T. So uh, I, I'm going to go Dia Bell and Malachi Tony, though. I think Heritage is going to improve to 3-2 and two and hand Central their second loss of the season. But I, I, I wouldn't be surprised either way, man. There's playmakers on both sides of the ball for both these teams. Yeah, no, I can I can dig it. But, I, I you know, I'm going to have to agree once again. I'm a big fan of Dia Bell and company. Yeah. Malachi Tony just, you know, he, he made a big announcement today, right? Yeah, yeah reclassified in 2025. Yeah, so, he, so now now he's you finishing know, he, out. These fans, these fans are happy, man, because that means they get Malachi Tony a year early. So That's that's huge. I mean, you know, we, we've had Luke Nickel, who's going in, you know, as a 25 QB commit. We've had Darion Coleman, who's a 26 QB commit. And, you know, Malachi Tony reclasses from 26 to 25. Yeah. Oh wait, I think uh, I think you might. Have got, there you go. Your mic went out for a hot second there, but you're back. So. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> Hopefully, I you know some of what I said came through, but nonetheless, yeah. the Miami Hurricane fans have a lot to look forward to, a lot to cheer for, and you know we said it last week or the week before. I'd be scared if I was any program competing against Miami in the recruiting trail. Because right now they are hot. They are, I mean, they are as hot as a program can be, especially within this recruiting space. In today's, you know, or yesterday's announcement when Malachi reclassed the twenty uh, from twenty six to twenty five, that's even bigger news for Miami. So yeah. keep an eye out. But I do have American Heritage. I think it's going to be a close game again. Uh, I got them by two scores over Miami Central. So. Let's see. Where do we want to go from here? And let's just go back out west. How about that? Yeah, let's, let's do talk it. about this one. What do you got here? I'm not big on. Uh, is it Basha? Is that how it's pronounced? Yeah, Basha. Yeah, Basha. yeah so look, you, you're gonna you're gonna teach me something because I don't know a whole lot of anything about Basha, unfortunately, and I feel ignorant to that. So I want to learn. So I'm gonna step back. I'm gonna let you talk me through this game. You know, the pros, the cons, the good, the bad, the ugly. Teach me a little bit about Basha and then Mission Vajero. And I butchered that, but I went with it yeah. anyway. Hey, you got to just go with it, man. Mission Viejo, number 10 team in the country. They're, I think they're, they're, they're the Vajero. third best team in the NFL. So, I mean, obviously Mission behind Vajero. Bosco. Yeah, Mission Viejo. So, but yeah, Basha, you know, obviously they had to replace Damon Williams at quarterback. This guy was, you know, a generational talent, one of the best players to ever come out of the state of Arizona and out of Washington. But, They've been playing great this year. They've dominated all three opponents. Uh, Gio Richardson, he's a stud wide receiver. He's a playmaker for them. They got a great offensive line. You know, Sam Garcia, Jake Hildebrand, also one of the top in the class of 2027. He's one of the best recruits in the state of Arizona, regardless of class. But they they face a diff, different animal this this week. You know, Mission Viejo, they're loaded everywhere. Dejon Lee, Alabama committee, he's a five-star corner, can also play wide receiver. And then you look, you look at this receiving group too, man. Phil Bell, Ohio State commit, he's a four-star. And then you got Vance Spafford, one of the best in the class of 2026. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the CIF Open Division One playoffs this year because I, I think this Mission Viejo team, they, they had a lot of injuries and didn't really have a lot of chemistry until late in the season. They started playing great ball. And then they won a state title, beat De La Salle. 
This year, obviously, they're going to be in the top bracket in the CAF Southern Section D1 field with the Modern Days and the St. John Boscos. It'll be interesting to see how they play against them. Obviously, Chad Johnson, the head coach there, he was the OC for Jason Negro for many years at St. John Bosco, I believe seven years before he took the job at Mission Viejo. He's done a great a great job with the Diablo program, but this is a big, uh, a big game for Basha, you know, to show Arizona can hang with California. We got two big California-Arizona matchups this week with this one, and then Corona Centennial traveling out to play Liberty, the defending open division state champ. So a couple of big ones, man, California versus Arizona this week. But I'm definitely leaning California in this one. I think I think Mission Bay has just got too many dudes on both sides of the ball. Yeah, no, I, again, I can't disagree. And, again, it's due to my ignorance not knowing Basha, and I know a handful of the dudes at Mission Viejo. Viejo, yeah. Viejo. Look, I'm going to – got to keep on working. Look, every week I'm getting better and better. I'm with it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. let's uh, let's just keep it keep it going, and let's talk about that big matchup. And we're going to close this thing out. What do you got here? Again, another big, big matchup, Centennial Liberty. Two and two, that, that that's a tough record. They're a much better program than two and two. But walk me through what you see here against Liberty. Yeah, I mean, I knew all along going into the year, Corona Centennial was going to be better after about the five-game mark. Obviously, they got some guys sitting out because of transfer rules. You know, saw on Longstreet, five-star quarterback. He was banged up, missed the modern-day game. Probably came back a week too early in that loss to Santa Margarita. He looked great last week. I think he had five total touchdowns, rushed for over 100 yards. At over 300 yards of total offense in that uh, big win against Lone Peak. You know, Lone Peak, a team that beat Corner Canyon earlier in the year. They were ranked in the top 25, dropped out after that loss against Corona Centennial. So a nice performance for Corona Centennial. They're starting to get better. They're going to obviously be right up there among the best teams in Southern California. They they get a chance to play Liberty, who's arguably the best team in Arizona this year. I think it's between them or Basha. But, uh, you know, Liberty's kind of in that same situation that Bash is in where they lost their quarterback. Navi Bruzon was absolute baller. Their team right in an 11-game winning streak. The last loss, of course, came to Corona Centennial last year. So they want to get a little get back this week. This time it's going to be in Arizona. It'll be a part of the Honor Bowl on a Saturday. So I think this is going to be an interesting game. But, yeah, I just think Corona Centennial is going to have too many guys, you know, Corey Butler has been having a great year so far this year. He's been the top receiver for the Huskies. They've been good defensively. So yeah, I think Corona is going to go in. Corona Centennial is going to go into Arizona and walk out with the dub and increase their winning streak to three. Well, that's not good because I want to disagree, but unfortunately I've got to go Centennial as well. Like I said at the beginning, two and two, that's a tough record. Doesn't necessarily reflect uh, the program that they are. I think they're a, they're a better team than two and two. And I think they're going to come come out this week. I think they're going to win pretty impressively. That's my take. Um, and when I say impressively, I'm going three plus scores. I'm going on a limb. We'll see. Quote me on it next I week. See but that. I, I can see that. I can see. I'm going to go more. I, I think they're going to win by 14 to 17 points around there. But I, okay. yeah, it's the. Uh, I'm telling you, man. Corona Centennial just at the beginning of the year. They're just banged up. They just weren't healthy. And now they're getting healthy. They're starting to click. So you might be onto something there. They might they might win this one by three plus scores. Nope, nope. I can definitely dig it. So that's that, man. Did we miss anything? Have, have we have we missed a game? Have we missed a, a big player that had a big performance? I mean, we had a lot going on last week. I'm live streaming a big in-state Maury Highland Springs game that turned out to be kind of one-sided. You know, Maury put the, the, the hurt on Highland Springs, so there was not a whole lot to talk about there. It was a lot of fun to watch and a lot of fun to live stream. You got to see Bishop Gorman take out their frustration on a very talented Orange Lutheran program. Oh, man, where do we go from here? What are we going to look forward to next week? What's a what's a snapshot of, uh, you know, what's ahead? Yeah, I don't think we got all the, you know, big time top 25 matchups that we've seen recently. But, you know, you got one this week, St. Francis, Modern Day. And obviously the games we just broke down. I think a lot of these games, especially the ones in Florida, will be pretty tightly contested games, you know, Miami central game with heritage and then obviously the Norland game also too. So we'll see, we'll see how things play out this, this week. It should be a fun, another fun week of action, but I think this is going to be a big week for the, you know, favored teams and nationally ranked teams. I don't think we're going to see a lot of chaos, but we'll see, man. We've seen a lot of chaos so far this year. It's been a lot of fun. I mean, chaos is, you know, bad for, for the program, 
it's a lot of fun, yeah. you know, from a media standpoint, from a fan standpoint. Uh, it's, it's always interesting to see, you know, upsets and how they occur and how teams, you know, build off of it. So we got a lot of fun to, to look forward to. We've got some fun matchups here. Florida is probably going to be the, the big games, like you said, this week. But we've got the Cali-Arizona matchups that we, you know, we don't want to discredit there. Anywho, man, that's what we got this week. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Follow Zach. Follow me on Twitter. Support our sponsors. I am Power Energy as well as the Great White Apparel. Check out their site, greatwhite.shop. More importantly, check out our nonprofit foundation, the 39 Hearts Foundation. Every strong athlete needs a strong heart, man. Damar Hamlin brought it to the forefront, but this has been a fight that we've been trying to fight for many, many years now. If you don't know why I do what I do, make sure you check out the website, spotlight39.com. Click on 39 Hearts. It's got the reason why I do what I do, why Spotlight 39 exists, why we have this show, why we are so determined to help student athletes across this great country live out their dreams. And more importantly, it's it's the reason me and Zach get to connect and have a lot of fun and just talk football each and every week with you guys. So support the brain that supports you. Till next week, man. I'm Rob. That's Zach. Spotlight 39 Live. This is the podcast. I appreciate y'all.